Hello everyone and welcome to season two of the happiness journey with Dr. Dan. For this season, we will be bringing guests who will share their own path to happiness. Now we all have a different definition to what happiness means to us, individually speaking. For some, it's a huge mansion by the ocean, while others would prefer excellent health and longevity. Now in this season, my guests will share their journeys on overcoming challenges and managing to keep moving forward despite the odds. Now this show will make you laugh or cry, but most importantly, it will inspire you. Now if they went through tough times and survived, you can too. Now no matter how hard things may seem, there's always something good coming around the corner. Sometimes painful things can teach us lessons that we didn't think we needed to learn. Now today, we have a special guest, Jordan Cooper, who will share his very interesting career in politics, his many challenges he had to face, the one he was successfully able to overcome, and the others, well, not so much. He will also discuss the loss in his political campaign in 2014 and his pursuit of campaigning in 2018. Now, Jordan is also the host of Public Interest Podcast and is the president of Revealing Our Humanity Communications. He has been actively involved with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act across the public and private sectors in hospitals, health insurance organization, and physician groups. Now, I can go on and on for an hour discussing his many accomplishments, but we'll focus more on discussing his challenges during his active political career. Jordan will share with us his journey to reaching happiness and how he managed his successes and failure during that journey. Now, Jordan, thank you so much for being here at the show today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Dan. Good. So tell us a little bit more about your political career. So, uh, of course, as you mentioned, in 2014, I ran as a Democratic candidate in District 16, which is Bethesda, Potomac, Friendship Heights, and Glen Echo, the southwest corner of Montgomery County. I ran to represent that area in the Maryland House of Delegates. Uh, but my record of public service goes back uh, f of more than a decade before that. So I grew up in Montgomery County, um, and I was first exposed to uh, state politics. Actually, when I was about five years old, my next-door neighbor was Dr. Alan Chung, and he ended up being one the first Asian-American elected to the Board of Education in Montgomery County hmm. uh, around 1990. I ended up uh, being a page uh, in high school in the Maryland House of Delegates, and then afterwards I was a legislative aide uh, in, in the House of Delegates for two years for a West Baltimore delegate. I've been involved in public service throughout my life. Uh, since 1999, I've volunteered almost every month of my life. I think public service is something that's ennobling, important, and incumbent upon those to whom much has been given. And so uh, I ended up working in, in politics for the delegate and volunteering as an election judge, volunteering on a bunch of campaigns, and I ended up deciding that the time was right for me to run in the very community uh, in which I'm from, uh, Bethesda. And so uh, I ran for the Maryland House of Delegates, and, and uh, I'm actually in a position where I'm running again now okay. for 2018. So what was the, the precursor, I would say, the reason why you didn't win the campaign? Was there something that you realized, I should have done things better? Sure, yeah. Well, so there were, the campaign, I, I have to say, I gave 100%. I had 80 volunteers. I worked for 18 months on the campaign. I left my job. I left my home. I moved back in with my folks so that I could dedicate all my time, all my money, all my resources into this campaign. I ended up knocking 12,000 doors. I sent out um, four pieces of mail to 15,500 people each time, printed out 140,000 pieces of literature, raised $60,000, had about 25 meet and greets, uh, was in the TV, uh, radio, uh, online blogs and newspapers 50 times with earned media. I mean, we had a great campaign. Okay. Uh, we released that, but why did I lose, right? <clears throat> a few things. I'm 32 years old right now. Uh, I launched my campaign at 27 and lost at the age of 29. I look a lot younger than my age, so <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, people Maturity. just <laughs> Yeah, and so, so people presume that I hadn't had much experience, even though I had, as you mentioned earlier, uh, experience both in politics and in uh, the health policy field. <clears throat> also, um, I was the only candidate. There were about eight Democrats running for the Maryland House of Delegates for the Democratic nomination. Only three would win. I'm not sure if everyone knows that, but there are three winners generally for the Maryland House of Delegates. And I was the only one on the ballot who had never been on the ballot previously. I was the only oh. one. And so name recognition helps. Okay. I was the only one without a house, a spouse, or a wife. I was outspent by about a half million dollars, and some of my opponents were able to lend their own campaigns uh, six-figure amounts, and something that I didn't have that luxury. 
Uh, and then also, I had dedicated my time uh, in volunteer work and service to the Democratic Party in Maryland, both through my work in Annapolis and in Baltimore City, but uh, I hadn't done and much I hadn't been politically engaged in District 16. In Maryland, yes, okay. but as Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House, uh, the, uh, the House Representatives in the 1980s, said, "All politics is local," mm -hmm. and so it really mattered. What have you done for me in our particular neighborhood, not the party at large across the state? So I think I those are the reasons um, why I lost last time. What's changed? So since that time, I've been able to become a property owner. I, I purchased a home in downtown Bethesda. I've been on about six or so boards um, in the last uh, five years or so. Some I joined while I was campaigning, some before I campaigned, and some since I lost the election. I'm on a commercial real estate board, District 16 Democratic Club, uh, the Democratic Party from Montgomery County. Um, I was a chair of the WSSC CAB, which is water and sewer. Uh, I was the president of the Lux Manor Citizens Association, so a number of different things to add credibility, and of course, I've continued to push my career and, as you mentioned, do the podcast. So mm -hmm. I hope that will make me more competitive as yes. we approach the June 26, 2018 Democratic primary election. Beautiful. Now, if, I mean, not if, when you do win in mm -hmm. 2018, what do you think that your involvement will change the neighborhood? How, what is going to be the core of your campaign? You know, that's a really good question. Right now, um, there are eight districts in Montgomery County. Each district has one sen senator and three delegates. So uh, there are um, a, what, uh, there are in uh, there are twenty four um, delegates in Montgomery County, and individuals don't they don't know exactly how each elected official will affect their lives. So the question is, how um, will me being elected change things? Of mm -hmm. course, you go and you go to the legislature and you'll, you'll be one of 188 different members of the Maryland House of Delegates. And you can't expect day one to change everything overnight because of just one delegate. So what would I change? Well, one thing that I'm seeking to bring to the state legislature is more voter participation. I was very surprised that one of the most wealthy and well-educated districts in the United States, Bethesda, Maryland, where half of all adults have a master's or higher and three out of four have a bachelor's degree or higher, mean household income is $124,000, I would have thought would be likely to have a high voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Turns out in, in the off-year gubernatorial primaries, about nine out of 10 adults don't participate and five out of six registered Democrats choose not to participate. So. There are many different ways, I think, that we can improve voter participation and thereby enhance the health of our democracy. If I were elected, I'd try to return the um, Democratic primary election to September when school's back in session, people are home and in the community not on vacation. Uh, that would increase voter turnout. I'd like to open the primaries to any voter who wants to participate. Right now, 20% of the electorate are independents. They're not able to vote in the Democratic or Republican primaries. I'd like to give them that opportunity. Also, I oppose gerrymandering, which is a process whereby politicians select who they want their voters to be as opposed to voters selecting who they want their politicians to be. I think it's backwards, and I'd like to let people know that their voice does matter. And I think uh, ending gerrymandering in Maryland, uh, which is where uh, politicians will choose what the districts actually look like, I think that will help uh, people have more faith restored in their democracy. Mm -hmm. Also, people may be surprised to know that 37.5% of the Montgomery County delegation, which is, again, those eight senators uh, and 24 delegates, um, have been appointed to the House or the Senate at some point in their career. I'd like to end the appointment process and move closer towards uh, special elections. And there are a number of other things I think that would change. Uh, I'd like to end corporate welfare. I think it's I'd love to have corporations in our, in our community, and I, but I want them to pay their fair share. And I don't think they really, Lockheed Martin needs a half million dollar tax credit every year. I think we need to invest in infrastructure and make sure that we have adequate school construction funds, that we aren't having 35 kids in a classroom. Uh, and we also need to have universal health insurance coverage. Health care is a big, a big issue for the United States. It's what I've built my career on. Uh, I broke my... Uh, uh, chops on health policy in the Maryland House of Delegates, and I think we need universal health care because right now accessing health care through emergency departments and 911 is inadequate. Uh, and finally, I would like to um, make sure that we have improved mental health care coverage because we can't require our prisons to uh, care for the mentally ill. So those are some of the things that I think if I were elected, I'd be able to help push through in the Maryland General Assembly. Beautiful. Well, um, we will take a quick break. Now stay tuned to hear more from our guest, Jordan Cooper. Message from the universe. You deserve the best. Be proud to know as much as you do about life, dreams, and reality. 
It was a long climb up the stairway of enlightenment, and many battles over false belief and mass consciousness have been won. You don't have to shout from the roof to live your truth, but don't be shy away from the ignorance. They need you. Nor be intimidated by the wise. They love you. And please, don't ever let self-consciousness keep you from stepping out into the world that would be unimaginably incomplete without you. You are a vessel of light, a holy ghost, and frankly, so dang hot. Proud to be you, the universe. We all have a mission in this planet, but unfortunately for 90% of all human livings in this planet, we have no clue of what our mission really is. When people pass away before their time, were they cursed to complete their mission too early? and we're not needed anymore? If you know your mission, can you delay completion so you could stay on Earth a little bit longer? If reincarnation does happen, and I believe that it does, can that mean that your mission wasn't completed by your prior self and your soul has been transferred to another physical body for you to complete your unfinished work? These questions may be left unanswered as every case is different since everyone has a different mission. What we can be sure about is a sense of awareness of who we are and what we feel we have been put on this earth for and act on these feelings. We may never complete our mission because of not knowing what it is in the first place, but as long as we constantly evolve by learning more about life in general, I'm sure that something will trigger and we will eventually find what we have been looking for. Now to learn more about the universe, be sure to catch my show, The Happiness Journey, right here on MCM. Welcome back everyone. My name is Dr. Dan and I'm here with Jordan Cooper. Now we're discussing about his life in politics and his many challenges in dealing with the ups and downs in his career. Now Jordan, thanks for being at the studio today. Now tell me more on how you find fulfillment and happiness through your public service. So that's an interesting question, Dan. Thanks for asking it. Um, Fulfillment and happiness. Oftentimes, it's not the most happy experience to be out there campaigning. Sometimes you're out there when it's 100 degrees in a jacket and tie. Sometimes you're standing at Metro and it's only 15 degrees outside and you're handing out literature and no one's paying attention to you. Somebody's yelling at you to get off their property. It's not always happy times on the campaign trail. So why is it somebody would do something like this? Well, I'm somebody who believes that meaning is derived from man and man assigns meaning to things and things become meaningful because we attribute meaning to them. I think that public service and the service of man is the most important thing that we could do in life. I have an inherent sense of the ephemerality of life and believe that those whom we can most greatly impact are those who are around us today, whose lives we can have a direct impact on. If I want to have a most meaningful life, I should impact them. I may not be able to have my name or my actions or anything about me remembered a few centuries from now. So in order to enhance my impact in the world, I'm trying to do the best I can for other people who are able to be impacted by me today. I think that for me, being part of something larger than myself, uh, uh, something, something larger than myself, a, a movement, just a, a sense of contributing to a greater good and that my life matters to more than just being about making life better for Jordan, but making life better for everybody. Uh, for some reason, that's, that's fulfilling for me, uh, for me and that's, that creates a meaningful life. Interesting. Now, um, after this campaign in 2018, um, are you going to be changing your angle um, versus what you did in 2014? Because with the mistake that you've learned, sure. do you feel that you're going to have to do something different to be able to increase your chances of getting elected? Right. So somebody pointed out to me the difference between working hard and working smart. I couldn't have worked, and nobody really worked, much harder than me in the 2014 election. I was out there, you know, pulling 18-hour days, day after day. This time, uh, I don't want to delve too much into the details of the strategy, but I'll say that I've learned that money is, is, is more important than I had thought, and in the power of incumbency. So I'm focusing a lot of my attention on fundraising right now, on, uh, I guess, enhancing my credibility, uh, building up the professional resume, getting out to certain individuals who may be able to endorse me and who may be able to influence different voter blocks. Um, last time I was trying to knock doors and have direct voter contact, get my name out there, I was able to get 2,900 votes, but I had hit 12,000 doors. Now you got to guess that maybe about 6,000 of those doors, no one was home and I left a piece of literature, but I was still speaking to about 6,000 voters and only about half of those ended up voting for me. So right now I'm going to spend my time 
uh, fundraising, getting good endorsements, uh, and then I think I'll move back towards the hardcore ground game as we approach the election in the spring. So it's a difference of where I prioritize um, all of my, uh, I guess, resources. Hmm. Now, the, even let's say if you had $200,000 budget, mm -hmm. do you feel that most importantly is where you invest the money and how you allocate the funds to be able to get the most votes? Well, Dan, let me ask you a question. I had a $60,000 budget last time. What do you think was the number one thing that I spent money on in my campaign? Um, TV spots, probably. So TV is a good answer if you're running for Congress. That's what Jamie Raskin did. I was his Bethesda organizer. He's now a congressman. Okay. Uh, uh, David, David Trone spent $13 million on TV ads, basically, in, in, uh, and some direct mail over a three-month period. I spent $29,000 on postage stamps. Wow. So direct mail is huge, especially in delegate races. I sent four. My opponent sent about a dozen. Um, so I think that really when you talk about a campaign, and by the way, all these expenses are viewable and accessible by and for the public uh, at the Maryland Board of Elections website. And you can see how I spent every dollar and who gave me every dollar. It's okay. all accounted for there. But essentially, you got to think about, well, one, I need people to know that I exist. Then I need them to, know, to, to like me and to want to vote for me. And then three, I need them to actually turn out and vote, to get out the vote process. So your money should be geared towards accomplishing all of those things. So money can be for the website so people can know about you, learn about you, like, like you. Money can be spent on sending direct mail to convince them to like you, to remind them when the election day is so they turn out and vote. You can help uh, pay for staff uh, and printing costs, but really the bulk of the cost is direct mail. Why? Because if I go and hit 12,000 doors, which is a course of 13 months, say I hit somebody uh, in July of 2013, and then the election comes in June 2014, they haven't heard from me in almost a year, maybe yeah. they forgot. So the mail will get it out to everybody again, same time. And that's, I guess, the advantage of having money is that you're able to hit all those houses again simultaneously. Uh, and that's what, that's what leads to a victory in, in a local election here. And when it comes to self-finance campaign, mm -hmm. um, what would you say the ratio between what you have to dish out from your own pocket versus what you get from investors or from uh, you know, people who will support your campaign? Sure. So um, some of my opponents, as I mentioned, were able, one individual was able to spend $250,000 on his own campaign. He raised some of that, but he gave himself a loan, uh, a, ca a candidate self-loan exceeding six figures. Two other candidates also did that. Um, uh, were able to contribute to their own campaign from their own pocketbook. Now, they're able to pay themselves back, and I have no idea if they were able to or not. I was able to give myself about $7,000 to my campaign and was able to pay myself back after the campaign was over, after I lost. I had some money left over that I was going to spend on a general if I had won. I didn't win, so I was, ending, I was able to clear up my debt. But I, was, I think the thing, one of the things I was quite proud of is I was able to fundraise uh, $20,000 in 5 10 and $20 bills, mostly in cash, while canvassing door-to-door -door in District 16. In fact, every hour I canvassed, I raised between $20 and $25 on average, and one in six voters who actually met me gave money out of their pocket within three minutes of meeting me on average. That's, I'm fairly proud of, that 850 unique contributors is almost double the next largest amount of contributors that anyone else got in my race. That shows that local voters are actually interested in supporting me, that they felt that I would represent them, that they were investing in me. And moreover, money represents uh, the ability to get into office, and it holds politicians accountable. Now, I think politicians should mostly be accountable to their electorate. That's who they're sent to represent. Mm -hmm. And I think that if the money comes from the electorate, then you're accountable to the money, which is the voters, which, so they're aligned, so you're becoming accountable to the very people whom you're supposed to be accountable to. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with lobbyists and special interests, but when you take money from organizations and political action committees, you somewhat become become uh, indebted to them, or at least somewhat more accountable to them, to your voters. And maybe they align, but maybe they don't. So that's why in this upcoming election, I've refused all political action committee funds and all funds from organizations. I'll only accept contributions from individuals, because it's only to individuals that I wish to be accountable. Wow. I guess this is like a real different world huh, in politics. It, it's a different world indeed. Yeah. <laughs> now, what if, let's say, God forbid, the campaign of 2018 doesn't pan out the, the way you want it to be. Are you going to go and try a third time? So, you know, Ed Koch uh, had a saying. He was the mayor and former congressman representing New York City. And um, he said, you know, basically, he would campaign for Congress. And if he won on Election Day, the day after Election Day, he'd go out, 
to the, to the subways and begin campaigning again. He didn't ask all the New York City uh, subway commuters, hey, I'm Ed Koch, I'm the mayor of New York City, how am I doing? And, and, and people say, Ed, you just won the election. You know, why are you campaigning again? And, and that kind of is my perspective. It's life is a campaign, right? So I've been campaigning since a kid. I've been doing public service. Uh, and my, my, my ideal is to be able to use my life to serve my country. I don't wish to die for my country. I wish, I wish to live for my country, to live for my country. I'm on a selective service board, which if there ever were a draft, I would determine who has a viable claim as a conscientious objector. And so in that spirit of giving your life for your country, I'd like to live for my country. And so if I were to lose, I'm not sure if I would run again a third time. Obviously, a county council member at large, Mark Elrich, was able to win on his fifth attempt for Montgomery hmm. County Council. Now he's the largest vote getter, and he's running for county executive. But um, I'm not sure if I would run again. I knew I'd run again uh, in 2018. And we'll see if there's a chance I'll win and there's a chance I'll lose. I don't know what the future will hold. I'll only know that I will continue to advance the public interest as best as I know how. And if I see a repudiation by the voters, then it may be that the best way to advance the public interest is not through elected office. Maybe that's not where my skill set is if I lose. Maybe that's the message that the voters are trying to tell me, in which case there are infinite ways mm -hmm. to, uh, to advance the public interest. That's why at publicinterestpodcast.com, I have made an, uh, an effort to highlight all the many individuals in our community who are seeking, as you are, Dan, to improve uh, the, the state of affairs for our community uh, and not necessarily through elected office. So mm -hmm. that'll be a challenging time. I'll take that uh, if, if it comes indeed to me. But I, right now I'm working to win uh, in a Democratic election. Beautiful. Now, are you, do, you, do you know personally the political co competitors? So uh, I know uh, some of them. I certainly know the incumbents. There will be two incumbents running for re-election and one vacant seat with a current delegate running for Congress. Uh, that is the vacant seat that I am vying for at this moment. Um, there always are a, a wide uh, variety of candidates who run for the districts that in Montgomery County that touch uh, Washington, D.C. So District 16 over here, District 18, District 20 over by Silver Spring. Those are the very politically active uh, districts where many of the individuals, the constituents, actually work in D.C., work in politics, and commute out to Montgomery mm -hmm. County. I know certainly the case has been the case for me, and many of my constituents are like that. And so you find a very well-educated, very wealthy community that's very politically active, uh, very philanthropic, and so there's a lot of competition as a result. So I think there will be about eight or nine Democratic candidates for the House of Delegates. Of course, only three can win. The two incumbents have uh, an incredible advantage, and it's nearly assured that they will certainly win, regardless of what anyone else does or what they do. Uh, and I think, I guess, it would be between me and the other uh, six or so candidates who are vying for that open seat. Uh, and some of them have been involved in the community more than others, and, and mm. we'll have to see how it ends up. Wow. Now, um, after the ninth candidate, this is when the registration for the competitor stops, which means after nine, no one else can uh, register. Oh, there could be 50 candidates. In oh, fact, can. if you okay. run for Montgomery County Council at large, you'll see there are 44 people running for that oh, right now. Oh, I see. Okay. The filing deadline is the third week of February 2018. After that time, you can't get your name on the ballot at any, any longer. Okay. So that, uh, that kind of uh, calendar deadline is when uh, you find who is actually running. Wow, there's a lot of uh, challenges you're facing eh, coming up uh, next June. It's not easy, Dan, but it's fun, it's worth it, and as we spoke about before, it's meaningful and fulfilling. So you feel that no matter what the outcome will be, you're always going to be happy. You know, I like actually being able to serve individuals. I like being responsive to them, having them have faith in our government and inspiring uh, their belief in a, in a noble cause that is public service. And for me, that's intrinsically worthwhile pursuing. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, wow, that's all the time we have for today. Now, we'd like to thank our guest for his time with us in our TV studio. Now, thank you very much for coming and inspiring our viewers and by sharing your very interesting and challenging career in politics. Now, I'm very excited about season two of The Happiness Journey, full of inspirational stories just like the one we had today. Now, here are a few concluding words of wisdom. Now, you know how when you visualize something every day, to such a degree that you can literally taste its reality and you believe in the likelihood of its manifestation with all your heart and soul. And as often as you think of it, in at least a small tiny way, you prepare for its arrival. So keep on dreaming and visualizing. The rest is all up to the universe.
My name is Dr. Dan Amzalag, and you have yourself a wonderful day.